I'm building bones with a couple of uh, colleagues since a couple of years, and the underlying <clears throat> technology that we're using in our platform are atomic swaps. Um, so today, first, um, I want to give an overview of what we do at Bulls. Um, so we offer uh, a way for users um, to move between different Bitcoin layers. Uh, so we uh, ha make it easy for users to move between the Bitcoin main chain, between Lightning, Liquid, and in the very near future, we are still working on it, but it, it will be um, released very soon, also the rootstock sidechain. So we are... Um, so something that people call a non-custodial exchange. And sometimes um, we also call ourselves a Bitcoin layer two bridge because we are bridging in between all these uh, different layers and sidechains. And um, the important part to remember is it's non-custodial. Um, are you familiar with the term non-custodial? Non-custodial basically means we are never having custody, we can never control user funds. We cannot steal from users, users cannot steal um, from us, not even for a split second. So even though we do a swap, we swap two assets, um, we never have control over, over the funds. And that's because of the magic of um, atomic swaps. So why would you even want to move between all these layers? Some people use another layer, like for example Liquid, to uh, um, do cheap DCAing, dollar cost averaging, so they're buying a certain Bitcoin amount every day and they don't, don't want to put that on the main chain because the minor fees on the main chain are very expensive. So they do that in liquid until they reach a certain amount and then they swap out back to the main chain into their, into their hardware wallet. Um, or they want to use um, um, more advanced financial products that exist, for example, on Rootstock. You can lend against your Bitcoin and all that kind of stuff. And a very prominent use case that we're still seeing for, for our swaps um, is lightning channel rebalancing. So this is something for professional lightning node runners um, to use atomic swaps in order to rebalance their channels. Um, we can talk a little bit more about this later, how exactly this works, but atomic swaps, how we offer them, are the only reliable way nowadays um, in order to keep your lightning channels balanced and operate a professional routing node or even as a shop to accept payments uh, to always have inbound liquidity to have your channels in a, in a good state or for spending um, we will see a demo later um, about a use case that uses uh, atomic swaps um, in a spending wallet like everyday coffee buy the coffee use case how do we do this and that's a term that i want everyone to remember when you leave here today um, when you're moving in between uh, in, in between different layers, especially, the only technology for atomic swaps that uh, is available are so-called HTLCs, hash time lock contracts. So whenever you do cross-chain or cross-layer in our case, and you have Bitcoin involved, this is the only technology exists, uh, uh, the only technology that exists everywhere, and that can be used for uh, atomic swaps. So a hash an HTLC consists of two things. A hash lock and a time lock. And finally, this is exactly how the Lightning Network itself works. So when you do a payment on the Bitcoin Lightning Network today, um, what you're actually using under the hood if you're routing your payment through the Lightning Network are HTLCs. So the HTLCs are atomic swaps actually in the lightning network that make sure that on the route when for example here Alice is paying to Carol Bob in the middle cannot steal so these atomic the same property that we have uh, in our non-custodial exchange are uh, present on the lightning network today already using the exact same technology um, called HTLC so that's really it so basically the only difference that we're doing here is we are behaving like just another no uh, lightning node on the network with the big difference that we can atomically, with atomic swaps, forward not only to another Lightning node, but also to the Bitcoin main chain, or to Liquid, or to Rootstock, and to many more in future. Is that concept understood? So it's basically one-to-one, -one, the underlying principle of the Lightning network, and it's called HTLC hash lock, or hash time lock contracts, that they consist of a hash lock and not of a time lock. Okay, here a practical example of um, 
a very famous type of atomic swap that we are offering on our platform. Um, it's called submarine swap and it's a lot of fancy wording and what it basically means uh, a submarine swap is when lightning is somehow involved. You can also swap between chains um, but someone decided, I forgot who it was, um, that if you involve lightning it's called a submarine swap but the underlying um, technology is the same. <coughs> So how, how does such a swap typically, typically happen? So in our case, we have the user and we have us, both. And we want, um, the user wants to send over liquid Bitcoin and wants to get back lightning in this case here. So what happens is, so how the protocol, how the protocol starts? So okay, the user first has to specify the amounts, how much do I want to send? Send 0 0.1 Bitcoin. And uh, then our platform will tell the user, you will get back 0 0.099 because there's a fee involved. The same way in the Lightning Network, when you're sending across the Lightning Network, the nodes in the middle that forward your payment actually take a small cut. We do the same. That's how we live. Yeah? That's how our business operates. Um, and we actually have a web app, a simple website where you can go, bolts.exchange. You go, you punch it in, and that's roughly how the interface uh, looks like. It shows you exactly the fee that we're taking, the percentage, the, um, the satoshis, the nominal amount, as well as the network fee um, that here is necessary in order to send the liquid transaction. Um, the second step is that um, uh, the user needs to create an invoice uh, for 0 0.099 uh, Lightning Bitcoin on the site and put it into our website, basically copy paste or scan it. And uh, then Vaults takes the invoice and uh, generates like a redeem script. And from this redeem script, we can derive uh, the liquid address um, where the user is supposed to send the liquid Bitcoin to. And you can already see, you don't have to understand exactly this, but you ha can see that somehow this address that we just generated and the lightning invoice from the user, they belong together, yeah? They are derived from each other, okay? So you can already see there's a hint on the atomic swap how, this, how these two are, are connected. So then the user sends 0 0.1 uh, LPDC to this, to this newly generated address that is displayed, for example, on our website. And Bolts waits for one confirmation, um, or in some cases also it doesn't have to wait for one confirmation, but let's just say it waits for one confirmation. And then pays, and once the uh, LPDC arrives in this, uh, we call it lockup address, in this newly generated address, um, Bolts starts and pays um, the user's lightning uh, invoice. And here's the key that is um, basic to, uh, to an HTLC and especially to an HTLC on the lightning network. Once you pay an invoice, there's like a secret on the other side that gets revealed in the moment you successfully pay the invoice. So that's called a pre-image. So this pre-image, Bolts, we only know, learn about it once we successfully paid the user's lightning invoice, meaning the user already received um, its, uh, uh, his or her funds in that case. And with this pre-image, we can then go and insert it into uh, the redeem script of the lockup address and like this redeem the liquid Bitcoin that were locked in this address. And you can see this pre-image is the same for the lightning payment and the liquid payment. So the key for the atomic swap that happened is um, that the uh, pre-image to be inserted into the redeem script is the same. So the redeem script previously was set up in a way with the same hash actually, so that it only is waiting for the correct pre-image to be entered. Um, that is exactly the one that we are getting from the lightning payment. So both use the same hash and the same pre-image um, to be redeemed. And basically use the user, once the user received uh, the lightning payments, um, the user can just go and leave and it's our task to actually use the pre-image that we then know and then claim the, bit, uh, claim the liquid Bitcoin. There are certain optimizations, for example, we could decide to claim 10 swaps together or, you know, like this is totally up to us when exactly um, we claim the liquid Bitcoin. Important is that we have all the information with everything that we need in order to do so. Okay. All right, now it gets a little bit more towards TabSwap and our history and how it works now. So um, up until January, we uh, used regular um, nested SegWit, actually like SegWit, um, in order to do, to do our swaps. And this is how an, uh, an HTLC is represented in, in Bitcoin script. Um, I'm no Bitcoin script wizard, but I, can, I think I can roughly explain what's happening here. So basically you have 
an if and an else statement. And in the if statement, this is basically, um, and this is always how HDLC-based atomic swaps work. If everything goes as planned and the pre-image corresponding to the pre-image hash is inserted correctly, um, then we uh, can redeem and the swap, swap is successful. Else, if that is not happening because timeout user just doesn't send the money or we don't send the money or wrong amount or you know, there's a, a couple of things that can, can go wrong, there's a time block path um, that has a timeout block height and that is for security reasons of the atomic swap. You have to basically wait um, many, many blocks until you can use that um, and can refund your coins back to your own address. So that's basically the path, the, un the unhappy path. Uh, if something goes wrong, you have this, you have this refund path. Um, exactly. Then it checks the signatures and, and executes everything. So that's, that's a very basic um, HLC, how it's represented in, in Bitcoin script. Uh, the hash lock, oh yeah, I even have that. The hash lock and the time lock. So knowing that, um, we know all this is actually on the chain. All this is in the, in the script, on chain, everyone can look at it. So with Taproot, things change a little bit. So with Taproot, we have many new things. Um, especially we have something called Schnorr signatures um, with Taproot. Um, so previously, or is still Bitcoin is still using ECDSA, um, but now additionally, um, you can use uh, Schnorr signatures. And the main thing, the main advantage of Schnorr signatures is that they're much simpler and they can be aggregated. So in very simple terms, you can um, aggregate them together into one. And that was previously um, not possible. Uh, so you can have two keys, one from us, one from the user, and we can aggregate it into one. And music two is basically like the protocol how to do so. So Taproot itself is a very interactive, sorry, interactive protocol. So um, you have to have a communication channel out of band. Uh, this can be a WebSocket in our case. It can be a Telegram message technically, right? So you have to, you have, to have some way to communicate uh, with the user in order to um, combine keys, uh, or exchange keys, sign, combine and broadcast. That's basically um, um, what needs to be done. And music too, maybe some of you have heard about that, is always mentioned in, in conjunction with Taproot is basically the protocol how to do so. What are the steps that need to be followed? How does the signing work? And, and all that. Music too is pretty new or fairly new, um, but is now, there's also music one, but it's, it's like old and abandoned. And basically music two is the thing now. And it will be merged into Bitcoin Core pretty soon. It was already merged like it's, it's uh, it's um, fairly stable by now. It's maybe like five, six, five, six years old. Um, but yeah. Um, and the second innovation that, uh, or the second change that uh, that uh, Taproot allows us to do is to not have everything in like one big script that we saw before. It's like all one thing. We can actually rip it apart. So the if and the else statement that we that we saw uh, before can be actually organized in a in a tab tree. Uh, so we have the hash lock, the if statement here, and the time lock, the else statement over there. And that is pretty cool um, because Taproot allows us to only selectively publish which branch of the tree we actually used. Meaning, if we were to execute uh, the atomic swap uh, successfully, we only have to publish this one, but nobody knows about the refund, about the refund and the time lock path, uh, in the script path. Yeah. Or if there might be even many, many more branches that nobody will ever know about because they <laughs> never have to be published. And that's something amazing about Taproot is it increases the privacy in that aspect a lot um, by you only have to reveal what you actually use and not all the possibilities that would have been, uh, that would have been possible. Come in. Um, question, yeah. A little bit. Um, for your use case, what is the advantage of not revealing the second part of the code. If the code is always the same, uh, you will have one example of uh, a transaction going su successful and one uh, not successful. So the code would be revealed, but 
You mean you don't reveal the public key? Uh, what's the advantage? The advantage is that you are not necessarily revealing that this transaction that you see on the blockchain was actually part of an atomic swap. Okay. You can see it has a time lock path. If you see it like together, hash lock and time, you know it's an yeah, HTLC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If of it's course. only the TLC part, then you say, okay, I, I don't know what was happening before. So it's a, in summary, it's a privacy gain uh, that you are having. And it gets even better as we, as we will see now. Um, so that's actually the classical part, just a little bit um, advanced now with Taproot in a way we can split it up and selectively reveal. But now we also talked about keys before. So um, with Taproot, um, you can actually uh, have two main ways of, of, of spending. And that is either via the script path that we talked about all this time, or there's something new. It's called a key path. And that's the actual real innovation. Um, so that you don't have to use the script at all, but um, use keys, in this case of us and the user, and you aggregate it, and um, to spend the transaction, to spend the atomic swap. And like this, you're not revealing anything at all about that this could be an atomic swap. So a key path spent transaction on the chain looks like a, sing a single sig, single key spent like a very, very regular transaction. And there's no indication at all that this was part of something much more sophisticated or even an atomic swap. <clears throat> so this is the, the, the real innovation that, uh, that Tepro gave us. But again, the condition is for the key path spent is that we have a communication channel and we have to work with each other. Meaning bolts needs to be online, the user needs to be online, the user needs to be able to generate these keys, to send them over, to sign them. So there's actually two rounds of communication I think are needed in order to go back and forth. First, send the keys, aggregate them, send them back, sign them, send them, broadcast them. Yeah. So that, that all has to be done in a very interactive way. But that doesn't matter. You know, communication is, is cheap and it's fast. It's, you know, HTTP, it's data packets. Yeah. How, how many, what is the percentage of tab root signed of transactions in, in, in the Bitcoin? In Bitcoin now, um, it's pretty high by now. Um, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's like 50, 60. Because it's I mean, it's unbelievably high already. It's not a regular transaction, but you see that. No, no, no. By now, by now, you can hide in the masses. That's what you're hinting yeah, at, right? Yeah, exactly. You can definitely, before when Taproot was very new and just released, basically you did a Taproot transaction and people saw it as a single six. But that looks suspicious to me because it's mm -hmm. everything else looks much more complicated. So that definitely was a, a Taproot spin. But by now, uh, the majority, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's a lot. Who is using that? I mean, there are wallets that use this idea. Yes, 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 yes. And it's getting better by the day. Right? So more and more, because of this advantage, more and more wallets are, are using it. Um, there's not a single, so before we launched uh, this feature, um, so our swaps are now Taproot based, we actually had to check that um, um, people don't have problems um, sending to a Taproot address that we give them, right? So we had to check that all, um, like every exchange, every wallet that there is, all of them support it by now. There, were, there was Coinbase until a couple of weeks ago that <laughs> didn't support it, but even they uh, do support it now, like Coinbase the exchange. So everyone supports sending to Taproot at least, to P2TR addresses. Okay, um, that a little bit about Taproot itself. Now we are coming to Taproot swaps. So the advantages of, uh, of, of, of Taproot, Taproot swaps uh, concretely for us is that they allow for something that we call immediate cooperative refunds. So for that, we have to learn a little bit how did these refunds, the time lock path that we had before, how did this work um, before? We had to wait 24 hours, sometimes even up to 72 or even longer hours. So one can imagine when you do a swap and it fails in the first place, and then you have to wait up to three or four days. That's, that's very frustrating. That's very frustrating and also very hard to understand for a user why they would need in order to, uh, to wait and to use the, to use the refund. And then you explain to them, yeah, because of atomic swaps, you need, you know, time lock path. That's that's how things work. And then it's like it's it's it's, it's difficult, right? So with Taproot, we realized by using this here key path spent. If we work together, in simple words, if we um, decide we want to refund now, balls agrees, the user agrees. We just have to combine our keys, um, aggregate them, sign and spend. We can issue the refund right now. If bolts were offline or if something you know is not available or not there, the script path still applies and the time lock is still there and the user can still definitely inscript it in the chain refund after the time lock expired. 
but with the new KeePuff spend, they can do it immediately, which is 99.99999% of all users are now swapping via KeePuff spends <laughs> as well as refunding via KeePuff spends. And that is such a big UX improvement um, for us that we didn't need to tell the user, hey, wait, um, come back in three days and, and try again. Because again, this is an active process, right? So it's not automatic. The user, there's a, a, a you need a key for the, for the, uh, for the time lock path as well in order to, to sign a transaction and, and spend it to your public key. So the user needed to save this information, then actively go, for example, to our website, use the refund button and, and punch in an address of, of, of his or hers, and then, you know, it's an active process. Um, and with immediate cooperative refunds, we are actually also now in a position where we can, some clients can automate that. Basically it says, um, if the swap fails, it immediately triggers the refund and it goes back to an address of the user. For example, if this client has access to a wallet of the user and can pull a new address. And that is a very nice UX and basically the swap failed, but it immediately bounces back to my wallet. That's what users see now um, happening. Um, another advantage of, is, are there questions regarding the, the refunds? When, when, when is failing? What, what is the most common reason for, for a failure of the... Of the swaps itself? Yeah. Um, Oh, maybe one thing I have to mention. Um, there are only refunds necessary f uh, for swaps that go from the chain to Lightning. For Lightning to the chain, from user perspective, um, the, the, the funds just bounce back. So if I send a Lightning payment and the swap somehow fails, um, Lightning payments automatically expire and it bounces back to my wallet, nothing to be done. But chain to Lightning payments, it's the user sending a chain payment to this lockup address that we saw before, and then it's sitting there. And then it, the user needs to claim the refund to get it back. So the main reason for these failing is usually us failing to pay Lightning to the destination that the user wants to pay to. This could be, for example, they're like a gazillion reasons, but uh, most of it is uh, mobile wallets that you need to open, for example, Phoenix. You need to open your Phoenix, it needs to be unlocked, it needs to be online in order to receive a Lightning payment. Uh, that's one major. Otherwise, uh, a non-custodial wallet like Phoenix cannot receive. It has to be active in that very moment. So you see me a lot in our support channel. Do you have your wallet open? Is it unlocked? Um, do you have enough inbound liquidity? Now it's less of a problem with Phoenix because they, they handle that mostly gracefully now with splice in, so they automatically adjust things for you in order that, so that you can receive. Um, in the past, it has been a huge, huge issue and others still have that. For example, they are paying to a small lightning node on the network and it doesn't have enough inbound liquidity and so we cannot pay. So then the swap fails and the refund is necessary. Um, or, and that leaks, leads me to the next um, point is, with legacy swaps, we actually were restricted. The Lightning payment itself was restricted to uh, a certain length of, of the Lightning route it could take. And that is because I left that out of the presentation on purpose. Um, it's because um, there is a, a time lock path for both payments, so to speak, and one has to be longer than the other <laughs> for security reasons. And we were with, with uh, regular swaps without Taproot, we were basically one part of the swap was uh, the lightning payments. We had to restrict the, uh, the, the, the time lock of the, of the lightning payment to a certain block number. And on the lightning, the lightning network is designed in a way that per hop you have, the, like per hop in the lightning network, you're adding um, you're adding blocks. So right now the default is 80 blocks. Um, so what happens a lot is that we have these short, um, these short uh, time locks and we are restricted to a lightning route of maximum two hops. So these longer uh, lightning, lightning routes we cannot take. Uh, and then the lightning payment fails because we cannot find a route. Uh, that was another reason. And now with, uh, with Taproot swaps, since Taproot swaps the key, through the key path spend, the refunds are immediate. Um, we can as well the time lock, we can as well go with the time lock and set it to two weeks because almost nobody is using it right everyone is using the key path spent now it's interactive so there are very very few like none actually no people uh, no, none of them has to has to wait for the actual two weeks in order to get their refund back so we were able to increase that uh, the refund time lock in order to increase um, the time lock of the lightning payment itself in order to increase the 
reliability of the lightning payment. I know it's a little bit of a brain bender, um, and we only realized that actually while we were in the middle of implementing taproot swaps, we realized that there is this benefit, and we're like, wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Cheaper network fees um, of taproot swaps simply because um, it's a, a, a single six band, yeah? so it just takes less space on the chain, always the same. Um, it doesn't increase like, because you have like, some little complex uh, script. Um, increased privacy, we spoke about it, um, that you basically don't reveal anything if you use the key path spend. And also easier script updates, um, simply because we can easily add more script paths before we had just the, uh, the if and the else with the uh, hash lock and the time lock. We could also add many, many more script paths to it and update uh, the script without impacting anyone. It wouldn't get more expensive for the user. Um, the privacy stays the same. You only reveal, if you really use it, you only reveal what you have. So it just um, adds a lot of flexibility for us there. Okay, um, a lot of theory. Yes? Sorry, how about your business model? Uh, yes. Uh, is, is it uh, on the per transaction? Yes, uh, on the volume. So we take a percentage of the volume that you're swapping. Um, I, I can open the web app that you can see it. It's not the end user, it's the service provider, but uh, it's not the end user who pays the... The end user pays the fee. Uh, end user. Yeah, like a, imagine it like a regular exchange model. Yeah? You deposit something into, into an exchange like Kraken, you do a trade, mm -hmm. and in every trade you pay 0.2% to Kraken mm -hmm. as a service fee. Same thing. Same on the Lightning Network. You send a payment on the Lightning Network for every single hop that you're taking on the route, you pay them a small service fee as a percentage. Always a percentage. You had also swap with, with Tether, right? We had it before. Um, we don't have it. Don't, don't, don't have it now. If you want, we can talk about the why later. <laughs> um, we had it before. So right now, okay, let's add it. Um, it's, it's a really interesting problem. So it's called the free option problem. So, um, in very simple words, that means if you, you are doing atomic swaps between two different assets, um, an attacker, or anyone actually, can go start that swap and then wait until the time lock expired, which is a very long time, many, many hours for sure, like for sure many, many hours, especially when you're involving lightning, um, and basically monitor the price of uh, that asset you're swapping, if it's favorable for him or not, then either continue with the swap or cancel it. Because the real problem is, it's for free, especially with Lightning. Uh, a Lightning transaction can be canceled for free. And that creates an attack vector. We actually suffered an attack in the very early days because we didn't understand it that well back then. Um, that um, attackers did that. Um, they, we had Litecoin swaps back then and also Tether swaps. Um, they created the swap. Um, they had, I don't know, Bitfinex, Kraken on the side open, and I basically monitored the price of, 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 of this and, and said, okay, now it's, the price is, 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 is going up, or is, for me it's good, um, I'm going to continue with the swap. Or the price going down, that's not good for me, so I'm going to abort the swap. And they did on a, that on a massive scale and let this train money from us. You know, this happens with the big, big Canadians. <laughs> It's, you can arbitrage in a lot of places, but with atomic swaps, it's especially bad because there's nothing you can do. Once you're in there, that's it. That's why we decided, okay, also because we are you know, very much Bitcoin people, we, we only do Bitcoin to Bitcoin. And if you're swapping the same asset, you don't have this issue. So, so the price of uh, liquid Bitcoin is not the same? It's asset. exactly the same. There's no so trading pair. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Point that is, uh, yeah. If it at some point differs, then it's a problem, actually. Depends on how much and stuff. But for example, rep, rep Bitcoin on Ethereum, actually the price is different. You have a trading pair on, on, on several exchanges. Whereas with liquid Bitcoin, with rootstock, you don't. With Lightning, neither. So basically, these only exist in the deposit and withdrawal options, but they never ever exist as a trading pair. But rep Bitcoin exists as a trading pair, so the price differs. That's also one of the reasons why we don't have it yet, because we don't know how to manage it yet. Free options problem. It's super interesting to, to read up. There are research papers out. Um, it's, it's a very cool thing. Uh, any more questions before I try to do a demo? Yes? All right. Um, do I have a. Maybe.
Okay, um, that's actually our web app. As you can see, it's very, very simple actually. You go to Boltzot Exchange, it's a bit smaller up here, Boltzot Exchange, that's where you find this. Um, first, I'm gonna just demo the web app, how it works. We're doing a swap from Liquid to Lightning. Liquid simply because it's relatively <coughs> fast and cheap and the main chain currently is, <laughs> is very expensive and, and also very slow. Well, the, the, just one quick question. The screens mm -hmm. for Liquid are the same, exactly the same than in Bitcoin? 90% uh, the same. The only difference uh, with Liquid is uh, confidential transactions. Um, so we will see so it. Yeah, Actually, we can, we can check after this swap. Okay. Yes, um, you have some extras on top. Um, so the so amounts and the assets are blinded. It was very easy from, uh, for Michael, my colleague who actually writes all the code, it was fairly easy. Only thing that needed to be handled was the blinding of, of the stuff. Otherwise, B Liquid can be described as Bitcoin Plus. It's like Bitcoin Plus some extras, some nice, nice features. Um, okay, let's swap, um, for example, 10,000 uh, Liquid Sats uh, to Lightning. And then what our web app basically asks you is the invoice. Yeah. And a Lightning invoice can also be retrieved, for example, from a Lightning address. And our web app um, supports doing that. Um, if I just punch in my Lightning address here, it will automatically fetch an invoice for 9,842 sats from my GetLB account. Uh, which is very convenient because I don't need to copy paste anything. I can type it out of, you know. I hope my internet is working. Um, and here we go. So that is the dangerous case. Remember, refunds are necessary f for swaps from the chain to Lightning. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are swapping from Liquid, the chain, to Lightning. That's why our web app now prompts us to download a so-called refund file. And in this refund file, you have the private key to sign your uh, refund transaction and so on. You have everything in there that you need um, in order to, to refund later on. It is also stored in the browser, in the local storage, but we have a lot of users that are using the top browsers, using private windows, and they, they do a swap, they close the browser and it's gone, right? So basically they nuked all their refund information and then the swap fails and um, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> So um, we decided to put this page that basically prompts you to, to download the file. To download the file. In that case, it's still locked somewhere. We were able to recover everything so far apart from two in our entire history because there's an emergency recovery case. So um, we, before we saw, okay, what is happening is here, it downloads the file with a private key in order to sign the, the claim, the refund transaction. Yeah. What you can also do is you can use the actual pre-image. Yeah, the pre-image is the thing that unlocks the entire swap, but here it failed, so the pre-image was never released out of the Lightning invoice. What we then did is, it's like, okay, where did you get this Lightning invoice from? They said, oh, it's from my node. Oh, great. Go to your node, type in this command, look up invoice, there you have a pre-image. Give us this pre-image, with this pre-image we can rescue your funds, because this pre-image actually unlocks this, the, your funds that are locked in there. If, and I'm actually in a discussion with them today, um, they used an exchange like OKX or Kraken and they created the invoice for them. The pre-image is with OKX and Kraken. So it's my pleasure to contact Kraken and OKX and say, hey guys, um, you have this user, he did a swap, it failed, you have the pre-image, you are the only guys that have the secret in order to rescue this user's funds. And so far everyone was willing to cooperate with us and uh, hand over the pre-image and we actually could rescue it, apart from two that I know of. But those were very, very special cases. Yeah. But it's a lot of manual labor. So our idea is we, we're doing thousands of swaps a day. So we have to reduce the amount of support cases that are being created because of this. And that's why this page exists, right? So this page basically shouts in your face, download, download the um, refund file just in case. Works on mobile as well, and mobile is actually encoded as a QR code because on iOS you can only download pictures, it seems. You cannot download anything else in a browser on iOS but pictures. So we encoded it in a QR code, the information is there. So we did a lot of hacks in order to, to make this work. Because our goal was we want to support every single device and every single wallet out there that there is. We don't want to tie us to a specific implementation. So it has to work on all operating systems and all browsers. And we are now, after five years, we're in a stage where it actually 
is working quite okay. We have support cases, but um, for the amount of volume we're doing, it's pretty okay. Um, I'm actually being risky today. I'll skip the download. Um, and that's the next thing that hits you. So what happened already now in the background is it took the invoice, it did the redeem script dance and generated an, an address for us to uh, send the funds to. And that's what we're going to do now. Okay. Oh, I'm an idiot. I only have 5,000. Okay, I have to create a new swap because I just remember I charge my wallet only with 5,000, not 10,000. Same thing again. <coughs> Okay, so now I am opening my liquid wallet. You can see here. And this is another very common mistake that uh, users used to do is, um, is they are sending the wrong amount happens a lot and then the atomic swap fails especially or it fails when you send too little and this happens when you're emptying your wallet for example your wallet is automatically you say I want to send now 5,000 sats but you have exactly 5,000 sats in your wallet but it's deducting the network fee from it so it only uh, we only get 5,000 sats minus whatever the network fee is uh, that you paid and then the swap fails and you need to refund um, so in order to mitigate that, um, we did a lot of different little tricks, but basically it's introducing these buttons here and especially introducing this and also working with wallet providers like Green, for example, which is one of the major wallets for, for Liquid. That so guys, um, BIP21 needs to work for you. So BIP21 is, a Bitcoin st uh, is an encoding standard, how you can encode an address, an amount, and a liquid also an asset and a couple of more information into one string and you just copy paste that string or scan it via uh, via the um, QR code and it automatically automatically prefills everything for you including the amount so there's nothing you can do wrong and more and more people are using mobile wallets uh, which is great they just scan the QR code and it's all prefilled and there's nothing you can you can do wrong so um, it's actually less and less people, especially that use our server, uh, that use our service, that are using um, desktop wallets, which is good for us because um, it works better. Um, sent. Let's see if the bug is actually solved. Yeah, see, it all prefilled it for me. Nice. Huh? And network fee. Why can I not click next? I can't see that. Still shows zero when I have money in there, I'm sure. I don't know why it doesn't allow me to click next, but let me try with my mobile wallet. I'm pretty sure I have enough money. But this happens, demo effects. Okay, mobile wallet. That's Agua, that's another, um, that's another liquid wallet. Let's see if my cable is long enough. That also, yeah, supports liquid. And I can send liquid now to this address. It already scanned it, already pre-filled amount correctly for me, perfect. And let's go. Okay. So it was sent successfully. Now in a second, our web app should detect that. It did. Transaction is in the mempool. 
And currently we are waiting uh, for one confirmation um, before we continue with the swap. That is on liquid maximum 60 seconds. So liquid has a deterministic one minute block time. So depending on what time I was the last block now, I have to wait to maximum 60 seconds, usually somewhere in the middle. And after the confirmation, um, that means that um, my funds from Aqua Wallet are locked in this lockup address, then Volts will go and uh, pay the Lightning invoice to my GetAlbi wallet that I entered before. Let me actually open my GetAlbi. Live demos are difficult. Okay, swap swap completed. I catch that. And it's in my wallet. Yeah. So that's basically how 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 easy it is. Sorry, because on time you, you where uh, did you send the money? On your I'm send it from my own Agua wallet to my own Lightning wallet. Huh? Because to, to Lightning. To Lightning, yeah. From Liquid, from to, liquid to, to Lightning. Lightning. Yes, that was the swap that we did now. Um, and you can go the other way around as well. Yes. So, um, I haven't seen you input the address. So it swap and uh, send the fund to the original address, but on a different network. Is that right? It sent. So I didn't put in an. I, I put in. I have to put in a Lightning invoice. So what I want is I ah, want to okay, go the, from, uh, from liquid invoice. to Lightning. So what I did, I put in the, my Lightning address, and then our web app went and got a new Lightning invoice from this Lightning address and sent it there. And now I have it in my in my Lightning wallet. Now, from liquid to Lightning. Yes. So the cost was, <coughs> I can't see my mouse, unfortunately. Um, let me go back to the, the page. So basically the cost was uh, the network fee of 148 Satoshis. Um, the bolts fee, which is five Satoshis, very cheap, 0.1% of the 5,000 uh, cent amount. That all together, plus the network fee that I used from my Agua wallet to send. So in total, you end up with something like three, four hundred, uh, four hundred sats. Um, the network fee on Liquid stays more or less fixed because um, there's always space in the block. So um, you can count on roughly four hundred sats um, network fee fixed, and then the percentage goes up as I put in higher amounts. So if I put in here, if I put in here, this. I suddenly see you suddenly see that the bolts fee went up to almost five thousand satoshis um, because it's a percentage is zero point one percent of the of the amount. And you see the, the network, uh, network fee and the bolts fee the, for, for our service. Okay. Those are the two elements. The network fee on liquid especially is is rather fixed because uh, the blocks are not full and you always pay very little um, to get in the block. And then the the bolts fee is zero point one percent of whatever you're swapping the amount. Let us compare this with the main chain. On the main chain, actually, it is quite often <coughs> vice versa. As you can see, the network fee on the main chain is almost always higher than, uh, than uh, our service fee, especially if you go the other way around. More questions? So uh, let's say I have a Bitcoin full node as a merchant, mm -hmm. and today I receive a Lightning payment on a daily basis, and I need to refuel my uh, inbound capacity. <laughs> yeah. Can I use uh, Bolts for yes. that? So um, some merchants actually do that using our web app. They are manually looking at their inbound liquidity. If you don't have that many payments, it's fine to do. 
Um, and what they do is they are sending from lightning to the main chain or to liquid um, also now is very popular actually in order to move what you're actually doing when you're doing this swap when you're swapping from lightning to bitcoin what you're doing is you're sending lightning out what that means is that the balance in your channel moves from your local side to the remote side and like this you have inbound liquidity that thing that everyone wants again uh, and that's how you rebalance your channels and you get inbound liquidity again it's a very popular way. The web app is a very manual way to do so, but we also have uh, clients um, with a command line interface right now um, that you can use to do that automatically for you. It's called Bolt's Client. It does the exact same thing, just it, uh, it's, a, it's a daemon that runs connected to your Lightning node. Um, it has a feature called auto swap, auto swap, that you can say, okay, if my, challenge, uh, if my uh, inbound liquidity is less than 25% of my total channel capacity, do the swap. You can, get, you can give it a fee budget. You can say spend maximum this amount in, in fees um, and all that kind of stuff. It, support li it supports liquid swaps as well. It's just a thing that you would use as a professional merchant um, to manage your node. Yeah. Do, do you plan to create a plugin for BTC Pay? <laughs> We're actually on it, yes. So um, we are writing right now uh, a plugin for BTC Pay that uses Bolt's client under the hood mm -hmm. uh, and allows you to do actually two things. And that's pretty cool in my opinion. Um, so first we're like, um, yeah, cool. We should have it in BTC Pay because a lot of people have their Lightning node connected to their BTC Pay server. Um, and then we can rebalance their node and um, you can, we can have you know, in the plugin a nice UI where you can configure everything. We even figured out a way how we can do the setup automatically. It's just click install done um, that's possible and uh, that will be possible but we found that actually a second use case might be even more interesting and that is you can substitute your lightning node with this if you want to let's say you are a merchant that wants to accept lightning but doesn't want to get into the business of managing lightning nodes especially managing liquidity what you can do is um, you can configure a uh, Bolt's client in a way that it acts as a lightning node and whenever a user pays something in your store, it shows actually an invoice from a Bolt swap and swaps into your liquid wallet. Yeah? And because fees on liquid are reliably low, you basically do a swap for every single purchase you have on your website. And it also especially makes sense if you have very few lightning payments maybe or, um, or a lot, but you, 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 um, it's we, we don't have to underestimate the costs that it takes, the engineering and um, yeah, the cost in general that you have to manage this because it's never unattended. This is actually unattended. Um, so you configure Bolt's client as a, as, a, as a substitute that uses Bolt swaps to swap into a, a liquid wallet. And the cool thing is that liquid wallet can be offline. Uh, it can be a, an XPUB, a, a read-only wallet from your Jade hardware wallet and it swaps into new address every single time. You have to do nothing. It's basically you set it up once and you forget about it. And all the payments, all the purchases in your store go into your, into your liquid wallet. And then one day you can say, okay, I have enough liquid now. I move to the main chain and, and that's it. And by the way, this is the next big feature that we'll launch, fingers crossed, next week is um, to go from liquid back to the main chain directly without any lightning from chain to chain. So that's something you were working on and we're about to release it. Um, why, why don't you put all your stuff in a wallet, in a bolt wallet? In a, uh, the, the, instead of using the web page, or you can you can put all you you mean we you, you mean we should work on a bolt's wallet? Yeah, and then and then people can just pay yeah. from Bitcoin to Liquid and whatever, and they will be transparent for. It's them. a very good idea, but we are five people, so <laughs> it is really a resource question uh, for us that we don't have yeah. enough bandwidth in order to develop everything in house. Let me show you something. So um, we want to, we are pr positioning us as more, you know, as a service provider that acts in the background. Um, you swap by, an, by the way, it's a normal API. It's just all the signing and all this atomic swap magic um, requires quite some action from the client as well. But in general, you can implement bolts. The web app is using the, an API. It's connecting to the backend via a regular API. So our idea is, um, and that's actually coming to fruition now, is that other wallets integrate us and build these super wallets instead of us building the wallet. Yeah, also, so let, let, me, let, let me demo it. So um, does someone have uh, a Lightning wallet here? Um, I think I asked you, do, do you have, can you show me an invoice? You have to come here though, because my cable is not very long. 
So may I introduce Agua? <laughs> what of Satoshi? Yeah, do something? No. <laughs> so what is what is Agua? Agua is a is a new wallet by by Samsung, by the way, by uh, Chain Three. Um, that is actually nothing but a liquid wallet, a very simple wallet, and it has um, regular Bitcoin main chain, and they call it um, uh, savings account because um, you only want to have big amounts there, not a lot of movement because it's very expensive, but it's the most secure. Uh, so you want to have um, your big amounts in, in this, in this uh, savings account. And then you have uh, spending accounts, and um, here they call it uh, Bitcoin layer two. And it's written liquid and lightning. What does that mean? That means it's actually only a liquid wallet, very that simple liquid wallet, which is really nothing fancy, but it allows you to send and receive um, from, uh, from, this, from this liquid account via Lightning using bolt swaps. Okay, so they actually integrated our, our swaps in order to have Aqua users use Lightning without actually having any channels, anything, nothing, nothing at all. And so far, people liked it a lot and I wanna demo it and hope it'll work. Okay, so um, like any regular Lightning wallet, the first step is scan an invoice, always like this, same thing. You do so, that reads the invoice correctly. Oh wait, does that work? Let's see. How much am I sending you? I'm sending you 5,000, I'm generous today. Oh, oh. <laughs> you. It's a little bug in Agua right now that it shows you success already, but we have to wait for one confirmation on the liquid chain. So they just want to be very nice in the UX to show success to the user, but right now we have to wait for one liquid confirmation. And it showed, should show in a couple of seconds. Um, the reason why we are waiting for uh, one liquid confirmation is um, until a couple of days ago, this was instant, it was like bam, so instantly. Um, because we were accepting zero conf transactions on Liquid, because Liquid itself is designed to keep zero conf safe, whereas on the main chain zero conf is not safe anymore, not at all. You should never ever ever accept uh, zero conf on on the main chain. On Liquid, it's designed. There, there we go. Success. Um, on Liquid, on Liquid, it's 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 designed to be safe, but we used it wrong. So we actually had someone uh, double spend us on Liquid. So we are now reconfiguring our system in order to safely accept zero conf again. So this transaction that we just saw and took, took I don't know, 60 seconds mm -hmm. will be five seconds again. That's how it was before. Yeah. And that you can see um, these wallets already exist and they enable a spending use case. And they also have Tether on Liquid, by the way. Mm -hmm. So this is really a wallet designed for everyday people that don't know and don't want to know much about the underlying technology. Um, it's geared towards markets like South America, where people are fleeing into, into a stable currency, want to hold uh, dollars. And so we are, we, are, we are setting on others building these super wallets, but using bolts under the hood. That's the idea. Because we simply we have, don't have the bandwidth to do it ourselves. Um, so with this wallet, I can directly convert uh, BTC Lightning uh, Liquid to yes. Tether? Um, not yet directly with, within the app. You can, you, maybe it even works. Let me see, I never tried that one. Tether, receive. No, you cannot, you cannot convert it yet. You can, you can receive different forms on Tether. So you can receive Tether on Ethereum, Tron and Liquid, but the functionality that you can convert from Tether, oh wait, the cameos? I think you can, yes. See, yeah, you can. This one is using, I think, siteshift.ai under the hood. Um, another um, another a swap provider, but it's custodial. Uh, so you, they don't do atomic swaps, you just, they just swap for you without. So, so you, you receive L, L bit, LUSDT? Yes. And 
let's say now you want to send the LUSDT to uh, Ethereum or Tron wallet, can you do so? You, you can do so. Um, you will just press in the sending option, you will just say that you want to send it to, uh, yeah, you put in an address and it automatically actually detects which chain it is. And it does another swap for you. So this entire wallet is built on swaps actually. Yeah. Just, we are not doing these swaps, it's a different swap provider. We are doing lightning to liquid and liquid to lightning swaps. But the USDT swaps are being done by Sideshift, I think, yeah. No, none of them. None, no one, no one. So, no, it's never atomic. No. Fixed float, Sideshift. We are the only ones that have a web interface that are doing atomic swaps with Bitcoin so far. There's another project called Atomics.lab that do um, lightning to Solana. Uh, I don't know who's interested in that, but you, that, yeah. <laughs> but atomically, yeah. <laughs> um, but all the rest is not atomic. So if you go to a website, Changely, it's it's never atomic. Bitcoin or Monero atomic swap. Where? You can do it, but I don't know of a website who's doing it. It's usually trusted. Uh, Samurai, I think, is working now on a. Uh, yeah. General rule of thumb you have a swap interface, swapping A from B, it's always trusted. You always trust this platform. Just keep it in mind. And usually also check the fees. So, Sideshift, for example, it's rather expensive. You usually pay 1% or more. So, that's. It's, you want to watch the fees for that. Um, yeah, that's basically it. That's the demo of our web app of Agua and Wallet that integrated us. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer some more questions. Uh, Samson Mao with Chen3. Um, yeah. He is, he was mainly doing, he worked for Blockstream before. Now and then with Chen3, he's now uh, doing nation state Bitcoin adoption. He's talking to governments and to, uh, he announced um, the Volcano Bonds uh, together with uh, President Bukele in, in, uh, in El Salvador. So he's working on these kind of high level, convincing high level government people to adopt the Bitcoin strategy for their country. Um, and Agua now is the main and only software project they're doing. So if you go to El Salvador, can you use Aqua? To yes, yes. El Salvador runs on Lightning via the Chivo wallet. It has a, a local wallet. Um, which basically everyone uses there, including the government themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we pay taxes, we pay to achieve a wallet via Lightning though, um, which is pretty cool because can you, you can use any Lightning wallet that exists to pay your things in El Salvador, including Agua, including, uh, including both swaps. Like in France, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, same, the same in Madrid though. Uh, so I was wondering if you somewhat work on adapter signature with Schnorr to, to do some swap too, because you could remove maybe with it the path with the hash and use it instead some kind of PTLC, but uh, on chain. Uh, or well, you can yeah. even remove, you can, with your adapter signature, you can just have uh, the key pass for the like a success case. Of but that's what we do. That's what we do already. So yeah, but here you have a script while with adapter signature, you can have no script. It can be the key path too for this case, for the case of success. That, that's it. That's okay. it. That's it. So the, 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 the script path is not used if the key path works. So the script path is just there as a fallback. Okay. So when you, when the, when you have a successful swap, you still use the key path again. Always, case. always. Okay. Yeah. Mm, yes. Okay. So the, the, the spare is not that much then, I guess. No. Yeah. So okay. But uh, I was no wondering script. if you were thinking about it, but yeah, yeah, I guess if it's just for the case of uh, the swap is almost successful uh, because the pre-image is exchanged, but uh, the, the, the people are not available to answer and make the <clears> multi <throat> signature, I guess. Uh, that's a bit restricted. <laughs> yes. So whenever somebody is not available to to do the co cooperative signing with us, we revert to the script yeah, path yeah. now. I, but I don't see. Yeah, I guess it would be useful. About it, some more. It, it would be useful if uh, you have issue to collaboratively sign, but that the swap is successful still. Hmm. Then then you could use an adapter signature 
to use the key pass even if it's not really cooperative case, you know. Mm. But I mean, the, the thing is that I know that the implementation of uh, adapter signature is still uh, in under review. Uh, and it was I'll pitch only... it to Michael, our uh, script wizard, what, what, what he thinks about it. Um, yeah. But of course, if we can avoid the script path to the best degree possible, that's, yeah, that's what that's we want great, in the end. But, yeah, I, I understand it's uh, not, yeah, if, if you can always fall back to the collaborative case, it's, it's okay. Because yeah. I have other applications with adapter signature where you don't really need the cooperative case because the cost of non-cooperative is actually the same. So you can just do oh, yeah. everything unilaterally. That's, yeah. that's quite nice for coordination of people. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, is this information... Uh, thank you. Is this information available on your website already? Or? The slides, you mean? The whole presentation. I'll put it into our GitHub. We have a... Um, we have a GitHub repo called Slides. <laughs> oh God, I can't see anything here. Did you say GitHub? GitHub. So github.com slash bold exchange. And there we have a slides repository where I always publish all slides and I will put it in there right after my talk now and then you will have it there publicly. Because so, so, I, I, you know, I, I came a bit late. So the, yeah. the, the beginning of the presentation will be there, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Recording, so oh yeah, we have a video yeah, recording. Yeah. On the what? Okay. Thank you. Okay, more questions? No? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.